I'm Paul. And I'm Ming. And welcome to Skip the Rulebook, the show that cuts through the politics of the rulebook, getting to the heart of your new game. Today we are taking on the system in Statecraft. In this game you are the head of a political party trying to make a grab for power. You must create policies, appease the masses, and occasionally abandon your morals to win over the voters. And if all goes well, your face could end up on a mountain. Let's skip the rule book. Not going to need this. Once inside the box, the first thing you'll find are the points trackers. These represent your political party, with their current ideals and budget. The wooden tokens are used to keep track of a range of values throughout the game. This is done by placing them onto the relevant portions of your points tracker. There are a number of decks of cards in this game which represent the major elements of any self-respecting government. We've got the politicians, faction leaders, policies, and most importantly, the supporters that we're trying to sway. Life on the campaign trail doesn't always go to plan. The events and emergencies deck adds an element of risk to each political endeavour. Finally, we have the scenarios deck, which will set the scene in which you make your rise to power, everything from a crumbling state to a capitalist haven. After all of your striving to get voted into government, you actually have to deliver on some of your promises or start to lose support. The incumbent marker and card are given to the player who's in the lead during play, as they may come a cropper of certain events as the game progresses. Finally, we have the reference cards, so you can keep track of the available actions each turn. Each player should begin by taking one of the points trackers and placing it to the side of their play area. In Statecraft, the overall beliefs and leanings of each party are represented by four ideologies, which are depicted by the four coloured bars to the right of the points tracker. These are socialism, capitalism, authoritarianism and anarchism. Each player begins with zero in each category, so you should take a number of wooden tokens and place these on zero of each score track. Each party also begins with an overall budget of zero, so place another token on the zero of the budget track to the left of the board. Finally, choose a player to keep track of the current game round. That player should place a token on the one of the game round track. Next, shuffle each of the decks and place them face down next to the play area. Each player should then take one random faction leader. This card essentially represents you on the political stage. Place it face up in front of you, ensuring you leave enough space either side of it for another two cards. Then return the rest of the faction leaders to the box. Now we must determine the forum for our political machinations. Draw one random scenario card and then read the title out to the group. Democratic Election. This card will have on it certain criteria for the end of the game as well as how to win. Each scenario also has on it a special rule written at the bottom that will alter certain actions or events. Place this card face up next to the play area where everybody can read it, then return the rest of the scenarios to the box. It's highly recommended that for your first game you select the democratic election scenario as it keeps things a little simpler while you're learning the game. Now we must find out who we're trying to gain the approval of by drawing a number of supporter cards. The scenario will indicate on it how many supporters to use during your game. For our game, we'll be using six supporters. Draw these from the deck and place them face up in the center of the play area. Return any unused supporters to the box as they will not be used this game. The policies and actions cards are how we will influence our potential followers. Deal three cards to each player to form their starting hand. These should be kept secret from the other players. When playing Statecraft you have the option of using the advanced setup. This includes the events and emergencies deck. 
We're going to leave this out for now, so we'll place these back into the box. Place the incumbent card to one side. Finally, we must decide who's going to start the game. This should be the player who'd most likely be embroiled in some kind of scandal if they were a politician. The aim of Statecraft is determined by your scenario. In our game, the aim is to get the most supporters by the end of the 8th turn. Each turn you have a number of different options available to you, referred to as manoeuvres. I will begin by doing what most politicians do best, announcing a policy in order to curry some favour. Some manoeuvres in Statecraft require you to pay a cost by discarding cards from your hand. Luckily, announcing a policy can be done for free. Each policy card is double-ended. When playing the card, you may choose which end you wish to enact. I'm going to start by announcing a standing army. The symbol in the top left of this corner indicates that it's a security policy. You may only play this policy if you have a politician of the matching specialism on which to play it. Luckily, my leader seems to be security minded. I place the card underneath my leader so that the chosen side is visible sticking out of the top. I must now pay any costs associated with my policy. This is indicated by the small circle next to the policy type. So to enact my standing army, I must reduce my budget by 3. You may never play a policy card that would reduce your budget below minus 5 or above plus 5. Each policy will affect how people view my party. To represent this, I must now change my ideology points based on the card I just played. So the standing army card will cause my socialism to go up by 3 and my authoritarianism to also go up by 3. In Statecraft, you can use each manoeuvre as many times as you like and are limited only by the cards in your hand. With this in mind, I'm now going to announce a second policy. This time an economic one, as it also matches my leader's specialism. I'm going to elect to privatise public services. I slide this under my leader so that the chosen side is visible. This time the cost actually increases my budget by three and increases my capitalism by one and my authoritarianism by two. It's important to note that no matter what cards you play, you can never increase your ideology points above seven or below zero. Each politician may have a maximum of three policies in their portfolio. The whole point of all this political posturing is to gain supporters. Therefore, for my next manoeuvre, I'm going to choose to campaign. When campaigning, you must check the supporters to see if you meet their desired ideologies. These are displayed at the top of the supporter cards. Those in the coloured banners are values that you must meet or exceed in order to claim them. Those in the broken dark blue banners are the maximum they will tolerate. So these single parents require you to have at least one point of capitalism and no more than three points of anarchism. Since I meet these criteria, I can take this card and place it in front of my party. I also meet the criteria for these industrial workers. Once you've completed all of your desired manoeuvres, you draw back up to a hand of three cards and play passes round clockwise. At the start of the game, we place the incumbent card to one side. This will change hands throughout the game as it should always be held by the player with the most supporters. Since Ming now has two supporters, she takes the card. In the event of a tie, the card simply stays where it is. A single leader does not a political party make, so for my first manoeuvre this turn, I'm going to recruit another politician. This manoeuvre costs one policy and actions card, so I must begin by discarding one. I now get to draw a number of cards from the politician's deck. The number of cards I draw is dependent on this scenario. In this case, I'll draw three. Politicians come in two flavours, junior and senior. You may only recruit a senior politician if you've already got a junior to replace them with. So in this case, as I only have my leader, I must recruit this junior. Once you've made your choice, place the card alongside your leader and then discard the rest. You may only have a maximum of four politicians in addition to your leader. Since you can do each manoeuvre more than once, I will now recruit another politician. While recruiting, you do have the option of replacing an existing politician. 
You may only do this, however, if at least one of the specialisms of your new politician matches that of the one you would like to replace. Since I already have a junior politician, I do also now have the option of recruiting a senior politician. I will choose this guy. Since his security specialism matches that of my junior, I can now replace him by discarding this guy and putting the new one in his place. Your leader is the bedrock of your party, so cannot be replaced in this manner. If your outgoing politician has any policies, those are simply placed underneath your new politician. Any policies that do not match the specialism of the new politician are returned to your hand. Since I could do with some supporters, I'd best get some policies going. I'm going to choose to play the prohibitive bureaucracy on my newly recruited politician. This costs me two of my budget, and gains me one socialism, two capitalism, and three anarchism. I will now finish up by campaigning. Since I have less than six socialism, and less than four authoritarianism, I meet the refined criteria of these industrial workers, and I add them to my party. With that, I end my turn. I draw three cards, and play passes to Ming. Once all players have completed their turn, the round marker moves forwards by one. As well as announcing policies, you can also choose to denounce them. This represents your party distancing themselves from some dodgy ideal. When you denounce a policy, place it underneath your chosen politician and the values are minus from your ideals. I'm going to denounce the free market. I place it under my politician and minus one from my capitalism and two from my authoritarianism. Each politician is limited to three denounced policies. This manoeuvre is meant that I no longer meet the ideological requirements of my supporters. Luckily, they are loyal and do not leave me just yet. They are now simply referred to as unsatisfied. I now also meet the requirements of Paul's industrial workers. Unfortunately, you cannot take a supporter from another player simply by campaigning. Instead, I must use my next manoeuvre, poaching. Poaching allows you to take an opponent's supporters if you meet the requirements. The cost of poaching is dependent on the status of the supporters. If they are satisfied, it costs you two cards. If they are unsatisfied, it costs you only one. Since Paul still meets the ideological requirements of his supporters, it will cost me both my remaining cards in order to steal his supporter. With my manoeuvres complete, play now passes to Paul. Well, two can play that game. Since a number of Ming supporters are unsatisfied, that means it will only cost me one card to poach them. I currently meet the requirements of these single parents, so I can poach them on the cheap. Another maneuver I can use to get my own back is by playing an action card from my hand. When playing an action card, simply reveal it to the group and then read the text aloud. Remove one policy from an opponent's manifesto and add it to your hand. Then carry out the action. This will also force Ming to reduce her ideology points by the number indicated on the card. You must then adjust your budget to match. The final manoeuvre you have in your arsenal is to fire one of your politicians. This is the means by which you can rid yourself of policies that you no longer want. This costs you one card that you must discard before you discard your chosen politician and then return his policies to your hand. You must then also adjust your ideology points and budget accordingly. Once you've met the ending criteria indicated by the scenario card, the game is over. The winner is also dictated by your scenario, so in this case the winner would be the player with the most supporters. If you like your political landscape to be a little more turbulent, you can opt to include the Events and Emergencies cards. To include these in a game, shuffle the deck and then split them into three equal piles. Shuffle one pile into the Policies and Actions deck. If you want a more disruptive game, shuffle in two piles. And if you want a completely chaotic game, shuffle in all three. When replenishing your hand, you may reveal an Event or Emergency card. If it's an Emergency card, simply read the card out and then follow the effects. If it's an event card, you've got a choice to make. 
Each event card carries on it two options. All players must choose one of those two options and then follow the instructions. Some event cards also carry this symbol. This means that the incumbent player has got an additional action that they must carry out as indicated by the text next to the symbol. Some event cards only affect the incumbent, which may be reason enough not to make two mad a dash for power too early. It's worth noting that event cards do not count towards your hand of three cards. If you draw an event card, resolve it and then continue to draw cards up to a hand of three. This may mean you end up resolving more than one event card in your turn. That's it from us to Skip the Rulebook. If you found this video useful, please press like. If you want to hear more from Skip the Rulebook, press subscribe. You can also find out more about us on Facebook, Twitter and SkipTheRulebook.com. Join us next time for your chance to jump into that brand new board game of yours without doing any of the tedious rule reading. See you later. Hold oh, on, sorry, I was looking somewhere else. <laughs> into another world. <laughs> Graham. Grey around. The go around for her. No, no. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. Ha ba da ba ba da ha ba da ba ba da ba. Ha ha ha, that was complete gibberish. Absolute twat. The cost. You're supposed to do a cheesy grin. Oh, sorry. I got that completely wrong, but I think it was okay.